Welcome and good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the donor education uh, series being hosted by the Missoula Community Foundation. The foundation works as a connector, an educator and fun funder in Missoula. The foundation's most recent expansion has been the ability for us to manage funds for donors. My name is Marcy Allen. I'm the executive director of the foundation and our mission is to enhance community vitality by inspiring community giving and strengthening nonprofits. We hope that this education series serves to increase awareness around philanthropy in our community. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, um, Mickey Smith. Uh, I would like to um, provide a little information about Mickey. Mickey began his career at Merrill Lynch Wealth Management in 2016 after teaching math and statistics at the University of Montana. Mickey is a member of the wealth management team, the KLO, KLO group, where he focuses on client relations, financial planning, and portfolio management. He holds a master degree, master's degree in mathematics and statistics at the University of Montana and received his undergraduate degree in mathematics at Regis University. Mickey lives with his partner, Nicole, in Missoula. He serves on the board of the Redside Foundation, a nonprofit supporting the health of the professional outdoor guides, and is an active member of the Missoula County Search and Rescue. I, uh, before I hand everything over to Mickey, um, I just wanna go over some Zoom et etiquette. Um, please turn off your volume um, to mute and your video off. However, if you feel inclined, you may turn your video on um, to ask questions. Um, your video um, not show up in the recording unless you speak. Um, if you have questions at any point during the presentations, please type them into the chat. Um, which can be found at the bottom center of your screen. And if there's questions that are really relevant to the topic, um, we will ask them. Mickey has informed me that he really likes questions, so please ask away. Um, if we if it's not relative and the, and the topic's moved on, I'll, we'll ask him at the end of, uh, in a Q&A period at the end. Um, please note that this event is being recorded and will be shared with, our, with donors who are not able to attend today. Um, Mickey, I will hand it over to you now. Thanks, Marcy. I, um, thanks for everyone for joining. It's like an intimate group. So um, yeah, please do interrupt if there's a question or if uh, there's a topic I don't cover at the end, um, I'd be happy to attempt to uh, answer anything uh, else that we don't cover today. So, uh, so Marcy um, asked me to cover retirement and plan giving um, today. So there's it's a wide range of topics, but I wanted to focus on a couple of things um, that um, specifically the Missoula Community Foundation can help with um, around plan giving um, and how it pertains to you know, using um, endowments that the Missoula Community Foundation can help um, donors and philanthropic folks set up. So um, the first, well, here's some first disclosures that Merrill uh, likes me to, to show folks. Um, first topic, um, a real simple um, way to, you know, to do Fill into fulfill philanthropic goals is just called a bequest. This is not anything complex, uh, but there's some minor minor details a lot of people don't um, understand. So a will, um, a lot of times, you know, it, you know, someone at really at any age should have a will. Um, you know, there's ways to name an organization or a foundation or endowment um, as a beneficiary to a will. Um, if you, you know, if you're looking to you know be charitable um, at the end of life. Um, that's a great and very simple way to do it. More commonly, though, people use something called a living trust, sometimes also known as a testamentary trust. Um, this can really help simplify naming multiple beneficiaries or naming multiple nonprofits or endowments um, and organizations or even um, an entity like Missoula Community Foundation. And the way a living trust works um, is you can name your actual living trust as the beneficiary or even title accounts um, in the name of your living trust. Now, to have one of these drawn up, uh, an estate planning attorney is, is usually needed. Um, and so there's some costs involved, but it's a pretty standard thing for, um, for I see, especially folks in their 40s, 50s, and 60s um, to be doing. Um, a couple of ways to use, uh, to set the living trust as a beneficiary. Um, there's something called a transfer on death agreement that you can add on type of like investment account, usually a taxable account um, that 
is that upon your death, the account immediately transfers to your living trust, and then the living trust has instructions to move money or assets to you know family maybe family members heirs and then you know for this for this you know or, uh, group of folks possibly nonprofits or charitable um, organizations um, you know you could write the Missoula Community Foundation as a, a certain percentage in your living trust you know name you know one five ten percent whatever percent um, you'd like to move into um, um, a char charitable organization the um other piece, you know, living trusts can also be named as beneficiaries to retirement accounts. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but you can also incorporate your living trust um, when it comes to retirement accounts. It's important to know too that with a living trust, you have, um, if you say you're, you know, you've named beneficiaries in your 50s and your goals, or you have uh, different preferences um, when you're 60s or 10, 20 years later, a living trust is a really easy way to kind of change all your 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 philanthropic goals or, or beneficiaries all in one document. So if you already have the living trust named as your beneficiary, and you change your living trust, um, you know have have the beneficiaries change. It applies to everything, all your account structures that are already set up. So it's a lot less. It's more work on the front end, but it's more customizable if you were to change things down the road. Um, bequests also um, can help reduce um, a taxable estate. And I, I could spend a whole hour on um, estate taxes. Um, I don't necessarily want to cover um, talking about the estate tax or sometimes referred to as death tax, but for very large estates, um, a really easy way to reduce your taxable estate is to bequest money to a philanthropic organization. Um, so if, if you have more questions on that, I'm more can, happy to talk about it at the end, but um, yeah, it's typically, um, yeah, a bequest is a very easy way to do that. So retirement plans, um, like I mentioned before, um, a living trust can be incorporated um, as a beneficiary to an IRA or 401k or any other retirement plans, but all retirement plans, um, whether it's an IRA, a 401k, a, a simple or a SEP account, a Roth IRA, they are all required to have a primary beneficiary. And a primary beneficiary is just what it sounds like. It's, it's your first beneficiary in line. A lot of people don't, or don't realize that there's also ways to uh, add a contingent beneficiary. Um, if your primary beneficiary is no longer um, you know, with us, um, your beneficiaries then flow, your, your money then can flow to a contingent beneficiary. So I recommend to use both of these and most um, retirement plans or financial organizations have you know, spots on their paperwork or um, on their online forms to add contingent beneficiaries. Um, how this pertains to philanthropic giving, you can name um, an organization, um, a, a nonprofit organization, the Missoula Community Foundation, as a primary contingent beneficiary. So a very common situation I see is your primary is your spouse, um, and your contingent beneficiary is um, could be a, a, a charitable um, organization. You can also split the um, your, you know, your assets in your retirement accounts using a percentage. So you could you know, leave 90% to a child or, or, or more children, um, and then leave the, the remaining 10% to um, a uh, charitable organization or an endowment, something um, like that. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in this. Um, you know, if you know, every, you know, we here you know, at, my, at my job at Merrill, you know, we cover beneficiaries quite often. Um, with folks just because it's something you do and then you kind of forget about and we, we want to uh, review that with people to make sure it still um, meets people's goals and they, um, they know they know what's what's to come if uh, someone wants to pass. Um, another um, concept with retirement plans are charitable, con um, excuse me, qualified charitable contributions. And this is a very um, kind of underused strategy um, when it comes to to required minimum distributions out of someone's um, IRA. So to back up with IRAs, when you turn 72 years old, that year, you're required to pull money out of your IRA. Okay, you've not paid any taxes. Um, you know, all the money in an IRA is pre-tax money. So the government says, hey, when you turn 72, you have to start pulling money out of your IRA. 
So you have a required minimum distribution. Now, when you take that distribution, you are incurring income and you pay taxes at your um, ordinary income rate at that, at that year. Um, if you were to make a qualified charitable contribution, this is taking your required distribution amount and putting moving it straight to a nonprofit or an organization um, that is qualified. Um, and you do this and there's some strategy, there's some benefits to that, that you are actually eliminating income. So that can be really advantageous. It's, it's a, what they call an above the line um, deduction, as opposed to if you were to pull your distribution out of your IRA, um, incur the income and then donate it to the nonprofit kind of in a second step, you're actually getting a tax deduction and, and, incur, and you're not eliminating the income like you would with this qualified charitable contribution. So if you work with a financial professional or a CPA, this is a great topic to ask. Um, you know, Marcy or myself can also you know, help um, explain this uh, concept. So if you're, you're taking money out of your IRA and you, you, um, you know, want to move, you know, you're gifting already, um, it could make sense just to go, you know, remove the middle person yourself and make um, distribution straight up your IRA to the charitable organization. Mickey, one of the things that we sometimes get questions on is like, uh, we have a donor that maybe is taking advantage of that and they don't think that they can split that required minimum distribution, but they can, right? They can, they could give, if the required minimum distribution from their account is 5,000, they could give 2,500 to Missoula Community Foundation and 2,500 to uh, Missoula Children's Theater just because they're across the street. And I th I'm thinking of that, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and then furthermore, if you, Say you are living off, um, you know, your distribution from your IRA. Um, you can you could retain ninety percent of your distribution from your IRA and then give you know the remaining ten percent to one or or multiple um, organ organizations. So yes, there's there are ways to split. It's not a hundred percent or or, or zero percent. Especially, especially if that required minimum distribution bumped you up in a tax bracket, so you could give a portion that would keep you in that lower tax bracket. Absolutely. Yeah. And what people don't realize is that. You know, when you take that that distribution from your IRA, you're you're increasing your adjusted gross income. Okay, and that can have um, ramifications for like Medicare costs. Um, whereas, opposed to if you were to eliminate the income by moving it directly to a charitable organization, um, you can you know lower that adjusted gross income. Um, I officially don't give tax advice, but we give a lot of tax advice um, to our clients, and we know enough to. Kind of steer people in the right direction. So if you're considering this, um, you know, my disclaimer is please do talk to a tax professional. Um, but yeah, absolutely, Marcy, there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to this. Um, and then one, one last thing, I know that there's a, a, a max amount that you can give as a qualified charitable distribution. And I, I think it's 100,000. Yeah, there are some limits. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, though, um, what we find is the required minimum distribution is much lower than that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's advantageous to keep money inside of an IRA. It's tax advantage. Okay. Inside of an IRA, you are deferring taxes. There's no capital gains tax. Um, and so it, it typically doesn't make sense if you don't have to um, take more than what the IRS requires you to take out each year. Um, so we don't see that limit um, come into play very often. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Marcy. I appreciate it. All right, so um, one topic that um, Missoula Community Foundation can um, help with a lot, um, and also another um, underutilized and kind of unknown um, concept is something called the endowment, sorry, the Montana Endowment Credit. Um, so this is a state tax credit okay, for Montanans, um, and it requires a couple of very specific things um, in order to use this credit, okay? And we'll, We'll, we'll talk um, quite a bit about this concept and, and how um, Missoula Community Foundation could help um, as well as you know, other financial professionals or, or CPA that you might work with. Um, so just some, some hard numbers, what this credit is and how much. Um, if you um, make a gift, okay, you can receive a tax credit um, for 40% of that gift. Okay, let me, I'm gonna pull out my laser pointer here. Um, so 40%, of the gift. So um, there is a limit though um, 
the credit can be, can't be more than $10,000 for a single filer. And then it can't be more than $20,000 for a couple filing jointly. Okay, so if you are you know, filing jointly um, and you made a $50,000 gift in a very specific way that we'll talk about, you would be eligible for a $20,000 tax credit. Okay, and it's tax credits are different than tax deductions, okay? Tax credits are um, more advantageous than a tax deduction, okay? They are, tax credit is a dollar for dollar offset of your tax bill, okay? If you owe the IRS, you know, you know $30,000, you know, you get a tax credit for $1,000, you reduce that bill by exactly $1,000, where a tax deduction lowers your taxable income, okay? So it's, it's quite different. Um, and I think sometimes people get that confused. Um, there's also, uh, this tax credit is available for businesses too. Um, so it's 20% of the gift. Um, we, um, we'll focus mostly on individuals for this case, just because there's this detail where you must make a planned gift to receive this credit. Okay, that's really important. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of different options to make a planned gift. We'll talk about a couple um, in this presentation. Um, the other piece that's very important is you must make the, the, the gift to an endowment, okay? Um, and not all nonprofits have endowments, okay? So this is where an intermediary, intermediary like the Community Foundation here in Missoula can come in, can be that, that intermediary, intermediary and help organize, um, one, the plan gift and also set up the endowment, okay, in order to receive this, this credit. Um, and a lot of times nonprofits, you know, being part of a couple myself um, now and in the past, um, nonprofits are really focused on their mission, okay? And then starting an endowment and an endowment for a nonprofit is a lot of work. You need a certain amount of assets. Um, so if you, know, if you have a favorite organ organization that you wanna to give to, but you don't see a way that you might be able to use this tax credit, um, this is, that's the perfect scenario where you pick up the phone and you call Marcy. <laughs> Um, or, or at least your CPA or, or some, someone you trust um, with um, your assets or, or financial life. Um, so the next page here, I have some hard numbers. This is a little busy um, just because uh, I, I do want to kind of stress you know, that this credit can be very advantageous. Okay, and um, the back part, I'm gonna switch to my pencil here. Let's see if this works. Okay, so the, again, again, we'll focus on an individual. There it is. Um, so this is for an individual. And again, you have to make a planned gift. We'll talk about a type of planned gift um, in the next couple of slides. So the way this, this chart works, you have a normal donation. Okay, let's say that you just donate outright, you know, $10,000 um, to an organ, organization. Um, you receive um, federal tax savings. Okay, that you get a 30% tax deduction um, where you're decreasing your taxable income by $10,000. Um, this can, that percentage can change. Um, but again, for this example, to make things simple, we'll say it's $3,000 that you are um, able to reduce um, as a cost to you um, on your tax bill. You would then also get a Montana state deduction um, equivalent to saving about um, $690. Okay, this is the top Montana stack um, tax bracket amount. Um, so the net cost to you is, so the donation is $6,310. Um, $6, okay, so you, um, you've made a $10,000 donation to the organization, they get $10,000, okay, but after your tax bill and after you file taxes, the net cost to you, um, the donor, is a little over six thousand dollars. That's great. Okay, it's, it's you know the organization has ten. It only costs you about six thousand dollars. Now incorporate the Montana endowment credit. Okay, so here's um, you make the same ten thousand dollars. You still get the same federal tax savings. You give up the deduction um, for state taxes but you get the 40% um, tax credit, um, the Montana Endowment Credit. Um, so you are now reducing your cost of the gift to $3,000, okay? So a huge benefit. Again, 
the organization, the nonprofit of, of your choice, receive the $10,000 gift. It only costs you the $3,000. Um, so um, if possible, if you are giving to an organ, a, a group, um, you, um, you know, should absolutely consider this, this credit. Um, it's, it's a huge advantage for um, you know, philanthropic folks. Um, and can really help nonprofits out when once people start to understand the power of this. So, as I said um, on the previous slide, um, you have to make a planned gift and it has to be to an endowment. Okay, so what are planned gifts? Um, one option is a charitable gift annuity. Okay, and the Missoula Community Foundation just, um, you know, started. Um, Start, started being able to offer a charitable gift annuity. Um, and their charitable gift annuities have some complexity in them, okay? But that's where um, Marcy and folks can, can certainly help. So here's, here's the basics. Um, you give a gift to a charity. Um, in turn, um, you receive a fixed stream of income, okay? To, typically it comes back to you. You can name other beneficiaries to receive that um, income over a certain lifetime or, or, or a, a term um, inside this gift annuity. Okay. At the end of the annuity contract, and we typically at death, at the, the donor's death, um, the remaining assets um, inside the charitable gift annuity um, are given to the charity. Okay. So that's where the gift is actually made. Okay. Um, the income stream, though, um, isn't always used. Okay. There's ways um, to defer the income stream or actually not even take the income, okay, making an outright gift just to the charity. Okay, I'll have an example on the next page. We'll, we'll talk more about how that works. Um, but this is considered, um, you know, by the state, a, a um, type of plan gift that then qualifies for the Montana, Montana endowment credit. Um, so we, um, yeah, a lot of times um, this has been a very popular um, an often used um, entity and um, type of type of fund to um, qualify for that credit. Um, there's ways also to make your donation um, even more powerful um, and more tax um, advantageous um, by gifting um, highly appreciated assets. Okay, so if you have um, say very low cost basis stocks that you've owned for many many years. Um, that's a great option to gift as opposed to cash. If you have, um, you know, a, a, um, you know, other types of assets um, that you're going to end up paying capital gains tax on, um, very a, a very common thing to do is, is to give highly appreciated assets. Um, it can make it even more powerful. So my example, um, the next page starts with. The grantor and the grantor is just a fancy way to say uh, the donor, um, and the donor in this case say has hundred thousand dollars of appreciated stock, okay, or very low cost basis stock. Um, they then gift that money or put that money into a charitable gift annuity. Now, a charitable gift annuity um, becomes the property of a, a nonprofit or organization like the Missoula Community Foundation. So the money is no longer in your name. You've made that gift. Um, and when you make that gift, a couple things happen. Okay, the, the, the benefits that happen immediately are you've won, possibly avoided cap, the capital gains tax that you might incur by selling this stock um, while it's still in your name. Okay, so you've eliminated capital gains, yeah, capital gains stock tax by using um, you know, appreciated stock to put into this charitable gift annuity. Um, the other thing that happens is you immediately receive a federal tax deduction. Okay, so you've um, maybe um, your plan was to give uh, to your your plan was to give you know over multiple years, but if you give a larger amount, you could receive that federal tax deduction all in one all in one uh, point. So you have a large tax um, year. You sale a business. Let's say you know you have you received an extra high income year. Um, this can be a great um, way to immediately reduce that income for that one year. And then also, since this is a planned gift and you're going to set it up, set up a charitable gift to give eventually to an endowment, you would receive the Montana 
uh, endowment credit, which is a state tax endowment we talked about previously. So inside of the charitable gift annuity, there's $100,000 now. Okay, the organization, Missoula Community Foundation, would, would sell the, the stock. They would have then $100,000 to put into some type of portfolio um, that can grow with, with investments. Okay, and that's kind of where Merrill and, and my job come in when we're working with the foundation here in Missoula. The original purpose of the charitable gift community was then to then send income, a stream of income, to the grantor, okay? Um, and then at the end of the term, okay, end of the term of the, the uh, annuity, or the charitable gift annuity, the remainder goes to an endowment, okay? Endowment um, or endowments, okay? So yeah, there's some, um, some ways to send money to multiple organizations or multiple endowments. Um, multiple goals, um, multiple interests um, using a place like the Missoula Community Foundation. Typically though, we get rid of, let's see if my pen works here, we can get rid of this income stream. Okay, so I, I find most people, the goal is that they want to give, you know, most of the money or all the money to the, to the charity or to the organ or the, to the endowment. Um, they don't really care about this stream of income, okay? Um, so there is a way to take deferred income, but then give up your rights to the contract to receive that, that income. Okay, you have to have the annuity life um, kind of in place for five years before you can give up that contract. Um, but, it, but the community foundation can, can organize that for you and kind of be the quarterback of eventually removing this clause from the contract and giving the money to, um, entirely to the endowment. Um, so a, a common question is, well, why would I want to go through all of this process? It seems complex. It, it seems like I need to now use a, another place like the foundation. Why, why, why wouldn't I not just give to the, or, to, the, to the group of folks or the nonprofit of my choice? Well, again, you have to make a plan gift to receive that credit. Um, and then also, you have to give to an endowment. Okay, and sometimes those nonprofits don't have endowments. Okay, so there's there are benefits to going through this um, with those two things: the the, the tax credit that you would receive um, by going by using this uh, charitable gift annuity. A couple more options um, that are planned gifts. Um, there's, these are a little bit more complex and can be used, um, typically I see used with larger amounts, um, but they, there are some, some downsides. So a, a couple more um, options are, that are planned gifts are called the Charitable Remainder Trust or Charitable Leave Trust. Um, both of these um, would need to be used, um, be set up by a, a tax attorney or, or an estate planning attorney. Um, they're actually drawing up the trust document um, and you know, working with you to kind of uh, you know, build it how, how you want. Okay, so there's a couple differences between these two entities. Uh, a charitable remainder trust is the first item here. Very similar to a charitable gift annuity, okay? It can create a stream of income for the grantor or the donor. Um, and then at the end of the trust term, the remainder that's left inside the trust goes to the nonprofit. Um, there's, there's ways for you know, the income to be large, small, um, lots of, lots of um, kind of customization with, with these trusts. Um, the grantor also contains control, more control of the assets. Now it's an irrevocable gift in nature, okay, meaning you can't receive and take the money back. But say you have you know, particular um, preferences on how the money is invested, okay, you would retain that type of control. Um, again, very funded with appreciated assets would, would increase tax benefits. That's a very common thing to do with these trusts. Um, and since this is considered a Montana endowment credit, or sorry, excuse me, since this is considered a planned gift, you would qualify for the Montana endowment credit. On the second piece here, a charitable lead trust is almost, it's almost the opposite, okay, of a, a charitable remainder trust. Um, less common, I don't see these as often. Um, and usually it's, I don't see you know, both of these just because of the expense needed 
and also you know the the complexity where you're still having to you're having to not file a tax return for these trusts it takes some ongoing maintenance um you know inside of your, of your estate or excuse me um, with your tax professionals but a charitable lead trust um, this creates a stream of income for a charitable organization okay so the income now as opposed to going to the grantor or the donor you're sending the, that income to the to the nonprofit. Um, and then at the end of the trust term, the remainder is left for some type of named beneficiary. Um, the named beneficiary, a lot of times would be an heir, children, um, you know, grandchildren, um, you know, whoever you'd like to like to name. Um, and all the, all the same um, concepts apply for a charitable lead trust um, that can be funded with appreciated assets and would still uh, qualify for this endowment credit. Um, I um, will switch now to, I, I kind of rolled through this pretty quickly, but I, uh, as I said, as Marcy mentioned earlier, I, I do, uh, I would appreciate questions if people have them or if there's a topic that you want me to expand on, I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions. And we, um, I believe you can turn your, your mute button off um, if you have questions. I've gotten a few questions. Um, one question was, can life insurance be used for giving? Yeah. Life insurance policy. Absolutely. So life insurance typically um, is not used, is not, you don't typically open a life insurance policy um, for philanthropic purposes. Um, and the reason being is the death benefits for a life insurance policy are tax-free. Um, so typically we see um, death benefits going to heirs as opposed to uh, nonprofits. Um, you, you know, using a life insurance policy is, is um, you're almost like doubling, you know, it's, it's uh, overlapping the tax benefits. Um, so you, you typically wouldn't open a policy um, for philanthropic giving. But that being said, if you have an existing policy, um, there are ways to, you know, utilize that for, for giving. You could uh, gift the policy to an organization or, or to the Missoula, Missoula Community Foundation. Um, if there's still premiums needed to be paid on the, the policy, um, you, know, you could gift those premiums to the foundation each year, um, you know, keeping the policy live or incre you know, increasing the death benefit. Um, you could also name the beneficiary, thus giving uh, the death benefit, to an organization or a foundation. Um, and it's, it works the same way, if, you know, if you wanted to send money to multiple groups, you know, the foundation could work with you um, to have percent splits of the death benefit. Um, but there, there are, you know, if you have a policy, say you opened it when you were 30 years old or 40 years old, you know, you're, maybe your spouse has passed, your children are now adults. Um, there's not really any need to have that death benefit um, to support, you know, children or, or a spouse, um, you know, maybe that policy is not needed anymore. You could gift the, the death benefit um, um, to a, a nonprofit or, or the Missoula Community Foundation. Yeah. And I would also just add in there that, you know, there are some things that nonprofits should be cautious about in accepting life insurance gifts. Um, and there's probably some due diligence that they have. So I would say that if a donor is interested in that, that they should really check with the nonprofit that they want to give that to, to see if it's within their gift acceptance policy or they have the ability to um, take that kind of gift. Um, I have another question. Um, what is the process for utilizing the QCD, um, the Qualified Charitable Deduction? Um, when should someone reach out to their investment company to ensure that it's completed properly? That's a great question. Yeah, yeah good question. So um, RMDs or, or required minimum, minimum distributions um, are a year end thing. So you have to make your distribution um, before the end of the year. So what we suggest, especially if you're um, going to do charitable, um, these QCDs is to start early, okay? It can take a while for, um, say the nonprofit organization to get you maybe wiring instructions or um, you know 
instructions to send a check. Um, so you just something you don't want to wait on. Okay, there's a lot of people are you know, busy at the year, end of the year. So if you if you think you want to do this, um, a lot of times we we call our clients in the summer that have done this um, um, in the past, and we we tackle this kind of early because uh, it can take some time. Now, if you're if you're more of a self direct person and you don't have a professional, you know you're um, you know, you're kind of having to you would be calling nonprofits, um, telling them, hey, I want to make a gift. Um, and then giving the instructions to whatever you know investment firm you use um, to send the money out of your IRA directly to the nonprofit. Yeah, and then I mean, are people taking? I guess this would add to the that question, but like, are people if people are needing the required minimum distributions, do they have those? Do they have, maybe have those already established to give to them during earlier in the year? Like if you have, um, you know, standing instructions to do it each year. Yeah. Yeah. So the way, you know, we, you know, for our clients that um, to make QCDs, we typically just save the instructions on file um, and then review with the client each year. If, you know, if, okay, last year you sent X to these, you know, 10 organizations, you know, do you want to do the same? We maybe increase the amounts to satisfy the, the required minimum distribution. Um, so it's, there's not a, I guess there's not an automatic way to have it just go out each year and something kind of you have to do on an ongoing basis. Um, so it takes a little bit of coordination, um, but again, the tax benefits of sending money directly, um, out of the IRA to the nonprofit is, is, can be beneficial. Yeah. Great. Um, I have a few other questions. Um, you, um, talked about uh we didn't we talked about this in another webinar but just um sort of when we talk about like estate gifts and bequests can you talk a little bit about the um lifetime and estate and gift tax and mm -hmm. how that's potentially changing in the upcoming years and sort of maybe how some of your clients are dealing with that that have larger estates yeah absolutely so um, Marcy is referring to the, to the lifetime estate exemption um, that people have. So um, right now the estate exemption um, is $11.7 million per individual. Okay, so I usually round it to you know, $22 million for a couple. Now you can always send money between your spouse. There's no limit that you can you know, send assets and um, between your spouse and, and back and forth. So um, we're talking about moving your estate to heirs, typically. Um, the estate exemption is planned to be reduced um, at the end of year um, 25. So on January 1st, 2026, the estate exemption will decrease to, um, you know, it'll decrease roughly in half, okay, to about $11 million. Okay, so that means that, you know, if, if you have an estate um, you know, more than $11 million. So this is, you know, homes, possessions, um, retirement accounts, any type of asset. Or 6 million for an individual. So, I mean, it could be, let's say I'm, you know, I'm married to Sam and Sam passes away and leaves me, you know, $12 million. Mm -hmm. And then a year later I pass away. And so that's a state still valued somewhere around 12 billion, right? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If it's an individual that's it's it could it's six, six point two-ish um, million dollars that it will be reduced to. Um, so as you pass, um, amounts above the exemption are would be taxed at um, you know, at you know, you'd get you'd receive an estate tax. Um, so there's also talk um you know, in Congress right now, we might actually see some clarity on this this week um, that that exemption might be reduced sooner than 2026, um, down to that half level, um, down to the 12 slash six million dollar level. Um, it could also be reduced. There was something that found it would be as low as three um, three million dollars per individual. So what what we've been um, telling clients are, if they were to reduce this estate exemption. Um, down to a much lower level. They're not going to do it immediately. They're, it sounds like what Congress is going to do is that they'll make it through the end of 22 of the current level or possibly um, that, that six slash $12 million level. 
So I don't, there's no reason right now, and we're not telling people to rush to your estate planning attorney um, to draw up a new grantor trust or something like that. Um, we're hoping for some clarity soon, um, but it is very important, you know, that you, you know, are in conversation with an estate planning attorney on this topic if you do have a large estate. Um, philanthropic giving is an excellent way um, to be, you know, tax conscious of a very large tax bill that your heirs could um, incur. Um, there, especially if you have um, illiquid assets, you know, if you have privately um, held stock or closely held stock or a, a business that's, um, you know, you can't sell a piece of a privately held business, you don't want your heirs to be, have a large tax bill that they can't pay. Um, so there, there is some planning involved there. Um, it's, it's a little bit, uh, there's a little bit frustrating that we don't have clarity right now, but I will say that there are ways to, to think about that and some, some steps to take right now and in the next year. Great, thanks. Um, I don't have any other questions right now in the chat, but um, if anyone would like to ask any additional questions. I think that's probably it. Well, Mickey, thank you so much for um, doing this for us and helping um, educate our donors. And obviously, if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to me or to Mickey. Um, thanks for joining us today and have a good afternoon. Thanks, Marcy. Thanks, y'all.